and in fact opens up for additional terrorist attacks. Our enemies have a say in when this war is over, and they have not given up the request for a global caliphate. Great leaders do not tell their constituency what they want to hear. They tell them what they need to know. And the American people deserve to make informed decisions, and they do not deserve to have the real threats against them obscured or our real efforts to combat them diminished. The president has not given the American people enough credit. They are strong, and they deserve to know the truth. Now more than ever, we need that kind of leadership. So what is the policy? Well, just weeks after President Obama attempted to define his counterterrorism policies, he conducted deadly drone strikes in Pakistan. And the timing of this is telling. It is clear that the administration is not drawing down its campaign, but is instead transitioning to a covert war. What the president is doing is trying to have it both ways. The administration is telling the American people that the war, the struggle, is over. And he is the one who brought it to an end, while at the same time fighting this enemy through different means. For example, the president has discussed more robust vetting for drone use, but all the while has increased their use without changing the status quo. Make no mistake, I believe the president must have the authority to conduct targeted drone strikes, as well as other tactics abroad against al-Qaeda and associated forces. And these strikes have decimated high-valued targets. However, the president's use of this campaign undercuts his argument that core al-Qaeda has been decimated. The concept of core al-Qaeda is, in my opinion, a false construct. Al-Qaeda is an ideology. It's an ideology that cannot be taken out by drone strikes alone. The inconsistencies found in these pronouncements versus the actions that followed have left Americans with a nebulous understanding of both the threat and what is being done to counter it. Failed diplomacy in Egypt, an inconsistent red line policy in Syria, threatening to leave Afghanistan prematurely, and an absence of direction in Iraq has left us where we are today, in an increasingly unstable environment with an administration intent on leading from behind on all fronts. Diplomacy. I'd like to talk more about diplomacy. It's something that the president likes to talk about. The president speaks frequently about the importance of diplomacy. But when opportunities for diplomatic leadership present themselves, the president is visibly absent. This administration has followed the wait and see diplomacy mantra, recently demonstrated in Egypt and in Syria, that translates to watching governments to do as they please until there are few diplomatic options left that can help. Past opportunities for American leadership and influence have been wasted, including the failure to bolster the cries for democracy from Iranian citizens during the 2009 elections with public vocal support. Concerted efforts to negotiate directly have also proven unsu unsuccessful. Recently, the White House has a, had a tense diplomatic exchange with Afghan President Karzai when Karzai called the president to the task on the administration's attempt to meet with the Taliban without including the Afghan government. This diplomatic failure was a huge setback in our efforts to work with Karzai and the Afghan people, who was a difficult but necessary partner in our effort to secure Afghanistan. Moreover, the administration's response of floating the idea of a zero option is even more troubling because it points to a frustrated, unplanned exit instead of a responsible, continued strategy. Egypt. When President Obama took office in 2009, he made one of his first trips to Egypt to talk about a new beginning. And in this speech, <clears throat> he spoke about democracy, among other topics, <clears throat> and how the U.S. and the Muslim world were going to start over again. Upon returning from his trip, the president started work on his 2010 budget and gave the Egyptian people a new beginning by dramatically reducing support 
for democracy promotion programs that could have helped stabilize the region. The same audience he promised a new respectful relationship with, the same group he promised American leadership for democracy to, saw the president's policy of contradictions play out in front of them. Ironically, these cuts made Egypt the least funded country in the Middle East in terms of democratic programs. And the Arab Spring came, and Egypt fell into political and economic chaos. The country didn't have the tools needed for the leadership transition. And it became clear that the democracy and friendship the president touted in 2009 was nothing more than hollow rhetoric. Ultimately, the damaging of this relationship is significant because we cannot put at risk the stability that Egypt provides in the region, which include the enforcement of longstanding peace agreements, most importantly, those brokered by the Camp David Accords. The second time since the Arab Spring that Egypt faced political uncertainty just recently, the administration, again, was visibly absent, choosing to analyze the situation instead of taking a position in order to promote stability. The White House's refusal to act will not help deter the chaos in Cairo. Its wait-and-see policy of diplomacy has again backfired and made us both an unreliable partner and diminished our ability to shape the future of one of our most important allies in the region. And then we turn to Syria. Syria has cascaded into a sectarian proxy war, but this did not happen overnight. And it is a case study in the ramifications of inaction. In two short years, Syria has become the centerpiece of Al-Qaeda's training strategy and one of the greatest threats to our homeland. The administration saw the bloodshed and waited. They read the reports of chemical weapons being used, and yet the president stalled again. They talked about red lines, and when those lines were crossed, they waited. The bottom line is they waited too long. Ally after ally, including France, the UK, and countries throughout the Middle East, asked for America to lead, to lead a willing coalition to stop the bloodshed and chemical weapons in Syria. And yet the president waited. And as accounts are coming in today from both U.S. forces monitoring the Civil War to our close allies in the region uh, that have been feeling the negative effects of a wait-and-see policy, the Civil War is moving toward a more unsalvageable outcome, an outcome which will negatively affect U.S. national security and the security of our closest Middle Eastern ally, Israel. President Obama has waited so long to get involved that any help given to the Syrian rebels is now fraught with peril. The once identifiable forces of moderation are now camouflaged and have been infiltrated with jihadists from all over the world. And now we are faced with a hotbed of instability in which anti-American radicalism is festering with no simple solutions. As I mentioned, chemical weapons have been used. These weapons are unsecure and now pose increased risk to the United States and our allies. The greatest risk, however, comes from the reality that Syria has now become the Mecca for jihadists around the world. Those secular forces that once could have been bolstered by this administration have been left to fend for themselves, and today their influence is undermined by various terrorist groups currently fighting in Syria. Where there was once a choice to positively influence the outcome of the Syrian civil war, today there are really no good options, no good options for resolving this conflict. And when it comes to Afghanistan and Iraq, <clears throat> I want to talk about a place where we've been involved directly for quite some time. I want to commend our soldiers who have made a great gains in Afghanistan and let them know that we're proud of them. We're thinking about them, supporting and praying for their success. And I want them to know that we are behind them now more than ever. Starting the job is often more simple than finishing it. I also want to tell them that we're not going to withdraw prematurely and undermine their efforts. I want to tell the Afghan people that we have fought for and beside and that we will not abandon them. And I want to tell this administration that, that their failed diplomacy will not 
and cannot be allowed to endanger our future Afghanistan, and that this zero option floated out there is not only counterproductive, it is dangerous. While our women, men and women should come home as soon as possible, and I believe the American people want that, the president has given our enemies in Afghanistan a timetable for withdrawal. In doing so, he's told the Taliban when to seek retribution. Just yesterday, the Pentagon reported to Congress that Afghanistan will need substantial long-term military support for the Afghans to hold off the Taliban insurgency. We know the danger in leaving Afghanistan unattended. We have seen it before when the Soviets pulled out and our covert operations ended. The unforgiving landscape of Afghanistan became a safe haven for Taliban-supported al-Qaeda terrorists. And if we fail to leave a force capable of conducting counterterrorism operations in cooperation with our Afghan partners, al-Qaeda will return and we will be back where we were before 9-11. The residual effects of withdrawal without a counterterrorism footprint moving forward can be seen today in Iraq, where increased sectarian violence spilling over from Syria and the growth of an al-Qaeda affiliates has led to instability and increased militancy. And while the Bush administration negotiated a status of forces agreement, when it expired, the Obama administration failed to do so, abandoning them with no stabilization assistance or advisors for securing their democracy moving forward. The recent Abu Ghraib prison jailbreak last week is the latest example of instability that directly affects the homeland and illustrates the growing level of operational sophistication